I'm Justina Maloney, an archivist with the Veterans History Project at the Library of Congress, and I'm here to provide you with a quick peek of some of our amazing collections. Let's take a look. 75 years ago, bells rang out around the world as Nazi Germany surrendered its armed forces, ending the war in Europe. The days following the surrender were filled with celebration, but the thought of the unknown lingered as the war in the Pacific raged on. Would these American soldiers, medical, and military personnel be sent to the Pacific? Would the war continue for days, months, or even years? Would they make it home? And if so, when? Like those of us sheltering in place, these men and women weren't sure what tomorrow would bring. All they could do was wait. It made sense for celebrations to pop up in Trafalgar Square, Paris, China, and even Times Square, but what if you're an American troop near Germany? Edward Wallace Hopkins was attached to Patton's Third Army while with the 411th Anti-Aircraft Artillery. When the war ended in Europe, Hopkins was located in Passau, along the German-Austrian border. The unit listened to President Truman's radio program announcing the end of the war in Europe, saying, The job ahead is no less important, no less urgent, than the task which now is happily done. At that moment, four to five German planes soared over the skies. He and his crew weren't going to take any chances. They shot the plane down and went to recover the pilots for questioning. As the day marched on, Hopkins' focus shifted to numbers. If this was the end of the war in Europe, could he go home? While he didn't have the points to head home, he did have an opportunity. While in France, Hopkins took leave to visit Paris and his little brother's grave. Reed Hopkins was killed in action during the war, causing terrible grief for the entire family. Edward Hopkins realized that he, nor his parents, would probably ever have the opportunity again to see his grave. Realizing he had to carry on, Hopkins was given the chance to attend a GI University in Biarritz, France, during the wait to go home. This waiting gave him the chance to pursue an education he did not think was available to him. Another individual who recalled VE Day vividly during her VHP oral history was Isabel Cook. Cook had recently graduated nursing school when war was declared and immediately signed up to be an army nurse. She served in a general hospital unit in North Africa, Italy, and was in Aix-en-Provence when VE Day was declared. Aix-en-Provence held a parade, and Cook, along with her fellow troops, were thrilled to participate in the celebrations. Like Hopkins, her VE day was also punctuated with the realities of war as she witnessed what would ripple throughout much of Europe following VE day, the punishment of collaborators with the Germans. Cook's VE day was also plagued with uncertainty in the fallout of the war. Since it was unlikely she would get sent home, Cook elected to train as a nurse anesthetist in Paris, expanding on her skills as a nurse and taking advantage of her waiting in Paris by seeing the sights. Cook received her orders to return home in September 1945. These personal stories reveal a deeper, more nuanced view of VE Day and what it meant for those who served. Though we are in the middle of our own time of waiting and uncertainty, I believe, like Cook and Hopkins, that we can find our silver linings, whatever they may be, as we remember VE Day 75 years ago.